let's do a check-in about my art business. It's been about four months since I quit my job and I've been doing art full-time. And I want to check in with you as to how things are going, what things I'm going to change, <laughs> what I've learned so far, and hopefully my lessons that I'm going through can help you with your decision to do something similar. So let's get into it. Before I quit my job, <laughs> I created a plan. And that plan was really considering how I was going to both make art and focus on teaching. These were the steps I took before I decided to leave. One, I saved as much as I could to give myself as big of a ramp going into this entirely new way of living and being where I was gonna be self-employed, everything that I was doing with my business, I was going to have to fund on my own, and I was also going to have to live. So I had been planning to leave since about middle of 2020 and into middle of 2021. And so this has been an ongoing journey for me. I just didn't want to be in retail anymore. So today, what I'm going to be sharing with you is what I do as a small business owner working to be a full-time artist in the Bay Area. I'm going to be sharing here my successes, my wins, my failures, my stumbles. <laughs> On March 30th, I'm actually taking part in my first ever Maker's Market in the Bay Area. It is going to be the Creative Communal at 4th Street in Berkeley. So if you're watching this and want to come out and see my work in person, meet me and say hi. Um, I would love to meet you. Definitely come out. That's going to be March 30th from 11 to 4. So definitely come out and see my work when that happens. If you like what I'm sharing in this video, you should go ahead and subscribe. Feel free to browse back through my old catalog of videos. I have quite a few things of adventures and I have a new one coming up really soon of my recent first ever backpacking trip to Joshua Tree National Park. So I went to all of these local makers markets, decided which ones I wanted to apply to and started creating a plan for how I was gonna apply to them. And I decided this year I'm going to try and do eight markets and that's gonna make up about a third of my business income. I did lots of research at those same markets. I was taking lots of notes on my phone and drawing little display setups that I liked in order for me to figure out how I wanted to create my particular pop-up shop for these markets. But what I want to talk about are the products that I'm making for markets. So I don't want to be like a traditional gallery artist and only sell originals. So I've been really thinking about different price points for my work. So I'm starting with 8x10 prints and then I'm going to make one edition of 5x7 prints. I also have some greeting cards that I've created. So those are six by six and four by six. So I'll be selling those as well as some stickers that I just ordered. Very excited about those stickers and some zines. So that way I have things that are starting at the $5 price point and go up from there. Meaning that if somebody likes my work and wants to support my practice, they don't have to be wealthy. I think too often art is seen as this very expensive luxury good and I fundamentally don't agree with that. So <laughs> some of the challenges that I've come across applying to markets in general, just as a heads up. When you apply to markets, each one has a slightly different application. Each one is going to probably want a photo of your booth. I highly recommend that you take photos of your booth and if you have a group of artists that you regularly chat with, ask them to give you feedback on your booth before you apply. I did not get in to the market that I wanted to get into the most here in the Bay Area because of some little adjustments that I could have made to my booth had I asked for the right feedback. But that's okay. <laughs> it's, it's, all, it's all a learning experience. Another thing is that the fees for your booth range anywhere from something like $150 to $600, and that's usually due when you apply. 
sometimes it'll be an application fee and then they'll let you know that they'll once you're accepted they'll charge your credit card but you have to be prepared for all of those fees and then that doesn't include the costs to get prints products other things that you're going to be selling in addition to your art so keep that in mind Another thing to keep in mind is making sure that you have a square reader, you know how to use it, and you've tested it out. So whatever payment processor you're using, I'm using Square um, just because they had the cool integration where you can actually take a payment from your phone without using an external thing. So I can take tap to pay payments directly from my phone. And also, but making sure that you know how to accept and process a payment and having all of your inventory in there before the day of the market. So another thing is figuring out how you want to display your work and it doesn't have to be complicated. I realized I was using this like, I was using this basket for all of my cards and then when I tried to pick them up, I had my entire inventory out on the table so it was taking a lot of space and then when I tried to pick it up, everything fell out of the bottom of the basket and it ended up damaging a couple of the cards which was a huge mistake. But I found this cool uh, Ikea Ospit dish rack, and this is perfect. It's going to allow me to display my cards like this out on the table, just each variant that I have. So that way it's nice, it's simple, it's easy, and it gives a little bit of breathing room. I might spray paint these. I honestly really like them as they are with this natural bamboo and it is an affordable way to showcase your work. So don't be afraid of using unconventional things like dish racks. You don't necessarily need to buy everything on Etsy already made for you. If you can afford it, cool, but I can't. I decided that my budget for making my entire display was gonna be $300. So I made my entire shop out of plywood and I built it all myself. And I will link down below the video in which I did my shop build out and you can actually see me step by step building all of the things for my shop because doing it myself was really gratifying and now I know that I could do it if I want to expand and build even more things for my shop. The other thing I'm doing is I'm teaching. So I have about 10 years of experience teaching and I want to spend a lot of time teaching both privately and at the institutions that I've built relationships with. One of them is with Bees and Blooms Farm up in Santa Rosa. It's an organic lavender farm and it is really cool. I love it. It's where I got married to my partner and I love teaching up there because the community is so kind and welcoming and awesome and I love be being able to just step outside of my classroom and have access to absolutely gorgeous nature. And then I also have a partnership with the Walnut Creek Arts and Recreation Center. It's called Community Arts Walnut Creek. It's this really cool organization that basically allows teaching artists like myself to propose courses and then they do all the marketing. Marketing is hard <laughs> and then you show up and teach and you get a specific cut depending on the age level that you're teaching for. So it gave me back my freedom and autonomy to make whatever kind of classes that I wanted. And it's also going to supplement my art business as it works to grow. And I also have the ability for you to book a one-on-one -on -one teaching session with me. So if you like my work and you want to learn a technique from me. Maybe you want to learn a little bit more about drawing or painting or how to use your iPad for drawing. All of those things are things that I teach on my website. So there's a link down below for my booking system where you can actually book a one-on-one -on -one session with me. And I can help you with everything from your creativity to organizing your files. So just let me know if you're interested in that. And again, you can support my business and that's down in the description below. So one failure that I do want to tell you about is actually with my art on the farm programming. So out of the courses that I have proposed, I had about, there's nine courses that I've proposed and there are four that have gone. And originally when I did the sip and sketch sessions, they were originally going to be a paid experience and I had no signups and I was going in about two and a half weeks out, a partnership with a winery, a partnership with Bees and Blooms Farm. I felt like I was letting them down. 
And so I decided, you know what, I'm just going to make this free. I'm going to make it a marketing program. And it went really well. I ended up for the first one, I had 20 people signed up and we were at the max capacity of that room. And it was awesome. And so sometimes when you have failures or setbacks, it's important to remember that it's not necessarily a failing on you. It's not you doing something wrong means is that you need to use those failures as little bits of information, as hints as to what to do next and how to really listen to your audience and the people that are interested in what you're giving and find ways to be more articulate in how you try to reach them. Because they weren't filling, I started to think, okay, I need to figure out marketing. And if you do a Google search on figuring out marketing and outreach, these days, everybody tells you make reels on Instagram, make TikToks, those types of things. So I started really focusing on both of those channels and I wasn't really getting anywhere. I've been on Instagram since 2012. It's been a long time and I, decided to drag my feet in terms of reels when they were really coming up in 2020, 2021, and I didn't want to do short form video content. And here I am making long form video content. But I dragged my feet on that and I kind of regret it, but now I'm able to do it and get in the swing of things. But all of my focus was Instagram, TikTok. That's where I'm going to find the people for my classes. And then I did this thing called uh, an ideal customer avatar exercise. And so I started to really think about like, who are these people? What are their lives like? And where can I find them? And a lot of my ideal customers, the people who I really like to teach are going to skew a little bit older. And because of that, I'm not finding them on Instagram or TikTok. I'm finding those people on Facebook. I'm finding those people on YouTube. And so I realized that I needed to really shift my approach and my strategy because I wasn't reaching. And even now, even with the strategy adjustments that I've made, I have an upcoming course actually that's supposed to happen in the end of this week and it didn't fill. And I paid for advertising. I really tried to push for more networking and I even did free programming in the Santa Rosa area so that way I could try out and see what was working. And I think that particular class just isn't interesting to people or it's the wrong time or the wrong day, but it's all a little bit of trial and error. It's really just throwing pasta at the wall and seeing if it sticks and slowly figuring out who it is. What's been really great about teaching those courses is I have found some kind of core audience super fans. So some really amazing people. And so that feels really good. It's slow. It's It's been really great working with the Center for Community Arts because they have a very specific way of saying that it takes quite a while even for them who are doing all of this marketing and they send out like paper marketing to so many people in the area that their instructors still struggle sometimes to fill classes when they're new. And so I'm leaning into the fact that things are just gonna still be a, a bit of a challenge as I'm building my audience. I am expanding the way in which I'm looking for commissions. So in the past, all of my commissions were things that I got from Instagram. So people just hopping in my DMs and being like, hey, do you want to do this really cool project? I actually got to do an album art commission that I'm so excited to show you because the album is going to be released soon. And I got to do the artwork for two singles as well. So I'm so excited to see my artwork on Apple Music and Spotify, <laughs> I'm like gonna geek out. And the band is very, very good. So I like their music. I really like the, the album art I was able to make. And I wanna do more work like that, but I can't just expect people to find me on Instagram and DM me. So I created a form on my Squarespace where I actually have info that people can set up and write exactly what they want in the commission, which is really cool. And I am 
really focusing on trying to reach real estate agents. So when you buy a house or you sell a house, you typically get what's called a welcome gift from a real estate agent. So I made an entire pitch page. I'm reaching out to real estate agents in the Bay Area and saying, hey, can I make custom welcome gifts for your clients? Especially being able to tell them that I can make work really quickly and that I can roll with whatever turnaround time they have. I recently found a local Bay Area printer that I'm working with to do my Gicle prints so I can get an archival print done on a relatively fast turnaround time. So really, really leaning into the possibility of working with real estate agents locally and having that be a big part of my commission practice. So the things that I like to do in terms of commissions, in case you're curious, is homes, interiors. I love doing portraits of people. I really like doing mementos and meaningful objects and making portraits of those. I love doing travel memories. So if you have, if you went on a vacation, took a really beautiful photo, you want that to be turned into a painting, I can make that happen for you. I'm gonna show on the screen commission that I made for my friend Chris. And it was these, beautiful photographs that he had from his childhood of him and his brothers and I turned them into digital paintings so you can see them both here. Thanks Chris for letting me share this with everyone here on YouTube. Down below in the description you can actually hop on and get yourself a commission because they are open right now. Another part of my business model is, of course, selling original pieces of art. Now, they're more expensive, and I know that I have to focus on building trust with people in order to sell those, but I'm focusing on making work that's a lot smaller than I typically would. So usually I'd work like 14 by 9 or 16 by 20, but I'm trying to work a lot smaller so that way my price point can be lower and I'm not compromising on my hourly rates. I have been listening to the Creative Pep Talk podcast by Andy J Pizza, and it's really good. Um, it's kind of cheesy, but with a man named Pizza, what do you expect? Um, but what I really like about listening to that, I have all of this self-doubt that just lives rent-free in my head all the time. I think it's like one part all of the critiques from art school and one part just my own mind. <laughs> and so what's really nice about that podcast is he's got a couple that talk about social media and how the things that you're doing to show up on social media need to actually, if you're working for free, you need to actually tie it to some kind of offer. I, I've been just posting and making reels of myself working in my studio, but then I don't have any of that artwork that I've made in my studio on my website. And so then I'm feeling frustrated, like, why am I not, why is nothing happening? Why am I not making money or being successful? It's because I, I'm not failing. I'm just not understanding that if I'm going to work for free and make essentially like a video ad for my work, I have to give people a place to buy it or to purchase a print of it so that way they can support me if they want to. So I spent a whole month really focusing on creating and cataloging my work for my website. So I don't have an Etsy anymore. I had an Etsy. I think I shared this in a former video, but I sold a print at one of my sip and sketch sessions and Etsy charged me a listing fee for that. And I realized that if I'm selling a lot in person, that's just not going to fly. So I got rid of my Etsy and then I upgraded my Squarespace plan to have the business plan so I can sell directly on my website. And I'm really, really happy with how that's going so far. So definitely take a look at that if you're curious as to what my shop looks like or if you want to purchase something and support me. Number five is my Substack. So a lot of artists here on YouTube do Patreon, they do little gifts and things like that. I don't work in a method that's illustrative enough to where I would feel comfortable regularly making things like stickers or postcards or things of that nature. But what I do want to give people is teaching <laughs> and templates and PDFs and things like that. So I have a Substack and I'm kind of using it like a blog and an email list simultaneously. So if you sign up for the Substack, you don't have to pay. It's totally free and you'll get updates as to where I'm teaching, where I'm having an art market, what new going on in my studio so you can get those i send them about bi-weekly eventually i hope to send them weekly but then each month for my paid subscribers 
I am giving out prompts and I'm also going to do little seasonal art lessons on there as well for additional videos. So if you're interested in supporting me in my practice, you can go ahead and go on to Substack to do just that. Number six, next thing on my list that I'm doing for my small business is I'm doing freelance content creation. So I started making reels on Instagram in May of 2023. And I've been on TikTok since about January of 2022. And so I've kind of figured out making decent short form content. And so I've had some people approach me asking, hey, can you actually help me create this type of stuff and create these types of videos? So I'm going to be doing that type of work freelance as well. And you can see a whole portfolio of that work on my Instagram. Again, link in the description. So another thing that I have is a store with InPrint. So if you're not familiar with InPrint, it is a marketplace for artists to sell their work and it's print on demand. So what's really cool about that is it's great for someone like me who's starting a business and having to figure out all of the expenses all at once. So what's cool about InPrint is it allows me to upload photos of my artwork and other documentation like my digital paintings and have them available for you to just buy a print. So that I really love. It's really cool. I love working with them. They take a 50% cut of any prints that I sell and they take about a 75% cut of any cards or products that I sell. But I think it's a really awesome way to get started. Eventually, I'm hoping to move away from that service into a print on demand directly from my website, but I'm not big enough yet. I'm small. So being a small creator, I think it's a really, really awesome place to get started. So I highly recommend applying because it's other artists like me who actually vote to invite other artists in. So you should join it. So I got to read this awesome book by this woman named Paco. I will put the name and the book here. I think money is this very abstract thing and we don't know necessarily what to do with it. And the biggest learn that I got from that book was about how if you have money in your bank account and it just sits in an account that has 0% interest, it actually depreciates in value with inflation. That was a shock. <laughs> so I found some smarter savings accounts and any savings that I'm living on is going to grow with me. Um, you know, late stage capitalism is rough and weird and I don't necessarily love any of those things, but I also have to look out for my ability to eat and grow this business. So that is what I'm doing is just trying to be a little bit smarter with my savings. I also did this thing called a lifestyle audit. So I think a common thing that can exist when you are working full time is that you lean into a lot of things that are for convenience. And I think those convenient things like pre-prepared meals or things that you just like throw in the microwave from Trader Joe's, those cost more than making meals from scratch. And so I was definitely leaning into things that were convenient and fun really, really cut back on as much as I could in order to make my life as affordable as possible. Another thing that I wanted to share is why the heck am I on YouTube? So upon making the decision to start making videos on here, I started to reflect back on the publication that I used to run. So if you didn't know, I ran an arts publication called Informality for the Kansas City art scene from 2013, and I stepped away from the project in 2020. And for those six years, I was solely focused on trying to document the conversation happening about art in Kansas City. But what I really, at the root of why I started that and why I was interested in interviewing artists and having conversations is I wanted to know what the conversation was and what the story was behind people's art. And I think that stuff doesn't get shared enough. I think so often artists are very, very focused on trying to make their work and then present it and then it's like, okay, you know, you get to figure out the meaning on what it's about and all of that on your own. And that's fine. But 
I always admired and loved artists who are willing to share the whys and the hows behind their practice and actually tell the story of why they make the work they make. And that's the main motivating factor for me to be here is for me to connect with other humans so that you can actually see the humanity behind the work. It's not just me making luxury products and expecting you to buy them. It's me exploring my creativity, showing you how to explore your creativity and inspire you to do similar things that I'm doing. I'm just trying to figure it out and I'm gonna share my struggles along the way. I'm gonna share how things have failed and how things have gone really well. But I also recognize that there's a lot of really awesome creative people trying to make this work and they're doing it here on YouTube. And I've been so absolutely inspired by all of these other creators that are sharing their journeys. And so I wanna be transparent and share mine and share the struggles and how it goes and how it doesn't. And already I feel better about doing this than I did spending months working on a body of work, framing it, driving it to a location for a solo exhibition, setting that up and maybe selling one piece versus being able to actually connect deeply with people. So if you've watched this far and you've loved this, thank you for watching. Thank you for hanging out. You can subscribe to me on Substack, paid or free. You can follow me on social media with the links down below. You can leave me a comment and say hi. You can subscribe if you are so inclined. And I'm going to continue to do updates like this. Do I think they'll be monthly? Probably not, but they'll be every once in a while so you can check in with how things are going. I'm living, laughing, and loving. <laughs> Doing all of this stuff is really hard, but that's okay.